Regardless of what your rating is, some of the most fun that you will ever have playing chess is when you orchestrate a nice attack on your opponent's king and you end up finishing off the game with a really nice checkmate. Now, that being said, it's also one of the most difficult things to pull off correctly. How many times have you attacked your opponent's king only to end up losing all your pieces and just not having a checkmate to finish off the game, right? Well, in this video, I'm gonna share with you the top 18 most important principles when it comes to attacking specifically. I'm gonna start off with some very basic ones, and then we're gonna to move to some more intermediate, and then we'll finish off the video with some more advanced ones. And after we talk about all those principles, I'm going to show you a game uh, that I played. And I'm going to point out where those principles were applicable at so you can see how that works in practice. All right, so the first principle is you normally don't want to attack unless you have a lead in development. So I'm going to show you a very basic and kind of silly example here. We play bishop c4, black plays knight c6. If we decide, you know what, I'm going to launch an attack on the king and I'm going to start by sacrificing my bishop to let the get expose the king. All right, here we go. What are you going to do now? You can play queen h5 check, sure, but then black's going to play g6, the pawn's defended, and black's basically going to laugh at you and say, thanks for the free piece. I mean, what are you going to do now? Yeah, you can come back here, and black's going to play knight f6, and look at this. You're just lost. Completely losing. Uh, so don't attack if you don't have a lead in development, right? So let's take a another example where, in this case, black plays the move a6, we play knight f3, and black plays b5. Now, the best move in this position is probably just to retreat your bishop. Okay. But if you wanted to sacrifice, now is a much better time to do it because you have a lead in development. You already have two pieces out. Black has no pieces out. And so watch how much different this is. Now we have a knight ready to follow up. We can take on e5. Okay. And if the king moves somewhere, black actually has to be pretty careful. Like if they try to go back, now the queen can come out. Our knight's being annoying where we can do something like this. We have some, some compensation. You might even say that white's even slightly better here because when we started the attack, we were ahead in development, as opposed to the previous example, if I go back, we weren't ahead in development here. We're just equal. Everybody's developed a piece. We don't have any advantage as far as development. So try not to attack unless you have a lead in development. All right, the next principle is that usually before you start an attack, you want to have good control of the center. So I'm going to show you an example. The king's gambit, okay, if black accepts it, we play knight f3. This is one of the main lines. Black can just play d6. We play d4, and then we're going to recapture this pawn. Once you start an attack out of this kind of position from the king's gambit, uh, usually white has very good chances. And part of that is because you have more control over the center than black does. And when you have control over the center, it's easy for your pieces to kind of choose which side of the board they want to go to. They can go to the left, they can go to the right. It also kind of prevents your opponent from doing a, a ton of stuff. Whereas when you have no control over, over the center, it's really hard to launch a successful attack. So keep that in mind, try to have control over the center. All right, the next basic principle is that when you go for an attack, you want to have an exposed enemy king. Now, sometimes this is just because your opponent has made poor choices. So for example, if your opponent makes a move like F6 and maybe follows it up with G5, they've completely opened up this diagonal. It's very easy for you to potentially get an attack or even a checkmate on their king. Um, but sometimes you have to actually create an exposed king. So let me give you an example. There's, a, there's an opening uh, and it comes about after the Italian game where after black plays bishop c5, you can actually sacrifice this bishop on f7 right away. Now, this is not a great opening. You're not going to see grandmasters play this, but I want to make a point here. This is actually called the Jerome Gambit. And the idea is that after black captures the king, you take on e5, sacrifice another piece, and then you play queen h5 check. And if black wants to hold on to both pieces, which they can, can do, but it's kind of risky, they have to play like king e6 to try to defend the knight. Otherwise, you're going to take the knight and at least get one of your pieces back. But if they do this... You're down two pieces, you, you kind of you don't even have that much development, so this is very questionable. But it's playable simply for the fact that your opponent's king is very exposed. And if they're not paying attention and they don't know what they're doing, they can very easily make a mistake and lose. Right now, like I said, against a strong player, it's probably not going to happen. But exposed king is a very crucial ingredient for a successful attack. Now, the next principle of attacking is that you need to be somewhat competent at basic tactics. So, you know, for example, one of the main lines here in the Jerome Gamut is you play f4 and you're trying to create some attacks with your pawn. If black plays the move knight f6, counterattacking your queen, there should be a move that immediately pops into your head. I'll give you a second if you want to figure that out. What, what do we play for white here? Well, the move that should have immediately popped in your head uh, would be queen takes e5 because we're getting out of the attack from the knight and we're also taking back one of our pieces and... Once the king moves, we're going to get back a second piece. We're going to get back both of our pieces. Now, uh, for, for you to be successful attacking, you would have had to see that. 
If your immediate thought was, oh, my queen is under attack, I probably have to retreat my queen, guess what? You're going to just lose the game because now you're not going to get any pieces, and block's going to move, and you just that was your chance. So to summarize, you need some basic level of understanding of tactics if you're going to be able to attack successfully. All right, so the next group of principles is going to be maybe a little more intermediate level than, than the ones that we just talked about. Uh, and the first one is that opposite side castling usually leads to more attacking positions, and that goes both ways for you as well as your opponent. And that's a lot of times has to do with what are called pawn storms. So you can see in this position, black has castled king side and white has castled queen side and what happens a lot of times in these types of positions is black will do something like c6 maybe white will play g4 black will play b5 h4 a5 h5 b4 you can you can see the idea right black is pushing these pawns launching an attack on my king and i'm doing the same thing over here trying to launch an attack on black's king so definitely keep in mind as soon as any game you're playing if if you castle opposite sides, you want to start thinking, okay, what's going to happen if my opponent starts throwing pawns at my king? And do I want to do the same thing to my opponent? Because normally when you're you're both castle on the same side, neither player really wants to start pushing those pawns forward because you create a lot of weaknesses around your king. When your castle's on opposite sides, I'm not creating any weaknesses on my king by pushing these pawns forward. Same thing for black. So you get these sort of double-edged positions, but you definitely want to pay attention and be aware of that. I'll give you a little pro tip here. One of the things that I really like to think about in these types of positions is whose attack is going to happen faster and whose attack is going to have the biggest threats. So for example, if I'm gonna be able to create a checkmate threat in one or two moves, and it looks like my opponent's attack is gonna take three, four, or five moves to really get any kind of checkmate threat, then I'm gonna say, okay, probably makes sense to attack. On the other side of that, if my opponent's like about ready to create a checkmate threat, and I'm not really ready, then I probably want to change my thinking to, okay, how can I defend and deal with these threats as opposed to counterattacking? So that's really something to keep in mind. All right, the next principle is that you don't want to attack unless you have a couple of advantages in your favor. So we've already talked about some things that you want to be thinking about, like, do you control the center? Do you have a lead in development? Um, is your opponent's king exposed? Things like that. And I'm going to be going over some more as the video goes on. But if you have several things on this list, that are going in your favor, then it's probably a good idea to attack. If you don't have any of those things going, then you probably don't want to launch an attack. So here's an example where we could consider playing G5 and then maybe like H5 and G4 and H4 and try to push these pawns and attack White's King. Like that's an option, right? But I want to ask myself, well, do I have more control over the center than, than White does? Not really. I mean, it looks like if anything, Black and White, sorry, White has more control because they have this extra bishop. Um, what about a lead in development? Well, no, I'm actually behind in development. White already has three pieces and they've castled. I'm behind in development. I don't really have more control over the center. Is my opponent's king exposed? Not really. Like, if, if you're asking yourself all these questions and you don't really have any advantages, then don't start throwing pawns forward. It's not going to end well for you, right? So only when you have some, at least some advantages, and it have to be all of them, there have to be at least some specific advantages that you feel like, okay, this is a pretty big advantage. Now I'm going to use that and go ahead and attack. All right, the next principle is that when you attack, you usually you want to look for specific weaknesses to take advantage of. Now, specific weaknesses can mean a variety of things, okay? So th there's not like, oh, it's always going to look like this or it's always going to look like that. No, there's, there's all sorts of different types of weaknesses. But in this position, for example, whenever white plays this move G3 to kind of fee and kettle the bishop, except they don't fee and kettle the bishop. So like in this case, the bishop's already sitting over here on C4. They didn't put it on G2. That creates weaknesses around your king. I've talked about this many times on this channel before, but whenever you see that, usually it's a good thing to try to take advantage of that. So if you're going to launch an attack on white's king with the idea of taking advantage of those weak holes, that would be a fantastic idea. And there's a couple ways you could do it. One would be to just put your bishop on h3 right away, chase the rook away, and then figure out how you can maybe get your queen there and checkmate. Now that's not that easy to do, but if already you have a somewhat uh, nice position to start an attack from. Another way would potentially be to play bishop g4 and pin this knight and think about playing knight d4 to take advantage of the fact that it's not being defended, it's pinned, you know, white can't even play h3 to chase your bishop away, you just take it. So that could be another way to take advantage of that weakness. But the point is, I've identified a specific weakness and I'm, and I'm going for it, right? And there are different weaknesses. Like, suppose that the white would have played the move h4. Well, what's the weakness here? I mean, well, this pawn is up. I don't know right off the top of my head. Maybe I'm thinking like if I move this knight at some point and trade this off, I could attack that pawn. 
That could be one thing. So you have to kind of figure out what those specific weaknesses are in each game, but you want to focus your attacks on those things. All right, the next principle is that you want to either have or you want to create open lines before you launch an attack. So what do I mean by open lines? So this could be open files or it could be open diagonal. So a really good example of this is the Danish Gambit accepted. Now, of course, your opponent doesn't have to accept it, but if they do, you keep offering these pawns, you push your bishop on c4, they capture here and you take here. One of the reasons why this is a very dangerous opening and it's it's leads to a lot of nice finishes for, for white, especially if black doesn't know what they're doing, is the fact that you have one, two, three open lines, which means your rook can go anywhere there and start being effective. Your queen can be effective on those files. And you have these open diagonals. See, I don't have any pawns blocking my bishops from being effective. And so throughout the course of the middle game, black has to be very careful what they do. You might play queen d5 and create checkmate threat on f7. You might play queen b3 and attack here and also attack there. You might play queen d4 and potentially line up here if you know, black castles later and create a checkmate threat there. Like you see how, how dangerous it can be. You might castle and maybe bring a rook here or bring a rook here or bring a rook here. Like black's gonna have to be careful because you have those files. And this is an example where we created those, old, those diagonals and files by sacrificing the pawns. So that's why a lot of time gamuts can be a nice way to um, get into these positions because you're creating open files right from the beginning. It doesn't always have to be a gamut. Sometimes you can just play a normal opening and then as the game goes on, you, you push a certain pawn forward and trade it off to create an open file or a diagonal for you know your pieces. That's another way to do it. But those open files and diagonals are extremely important in successful attacks. All right, the next principle is that when you attack, you wanna be able to remove key defenders. Now, here's an example, which is a little bit of a weird example, but this is a game that Gary Kasparov played as black in the Sicilian, and this is, demonstrates a, a kind of a famous idea in the Sicilian. So, um, white has castled queenside, and the king actually looks pretty safe, right? Like, you've got the pawns in front of it, there's not really a lot of weaknesses. White has good control of the center. Um, White has a lead in development. Like white has a lot of things going. And yet, despite that, black is able to launch a successful attack. And the way that Gary Kasparov did it was rook takes c3. And basically what's happening here is he's removing a key defender. And actually there's there's kind of two defenders that are being removed in, at the same time. And it's kind of weird, but basically the knight that was sort of defending the king is now gone. And when white recaptures, well, now that nice little pretty pawn wall that was defending White's king is all messed up. You can see that this is open now, right? There's a hole here. Um, this is weak. All these pawns are kind of weak. And so even though Black's giving up that exchange and it looks like, why are you going to follow that up? There are, are some significant weaknesses because that key defender was removed. And you can see, you know, Gary goes for this threat. White defends it with the knight. Um, and then eventually Gary kind of builds the pressure here, knight a4. And you can start to see how it's not that easy for white to defend. So, and he's also trying to kind of cover up these squares. Anyway, as the game goes on, you know, black did some cool things. And you can see again how white's king is somewhat exposed and Gary was able to win the game. So I'm not going to show you the whole game. The point is be on the lookout for whatever piece is defending your opponent the most. And can you maybe sacrifice to get rid of it or even just trade it off? Sometimes you can just do a simple trade. You don't have to actually sacrifice pieces every single time but you wanna be keeping an eye out for that. The next principle is that momentum is important. What do I mean by momentum? Momentum is forcing moves. So if you're putting your opponent in check or if you're threatening a high value piece like a queen or a rook or something like that, they have to deal with it, right? That is what you wanna be on the lookout for when you're attacking. So here's an example. This is the Greek gift sacrifice, pretty common example, but you sacrifice your bishop on h7 to lure your opponent's king out. And what do you notice about that move? Well, it's check. So black has to take you or they have to move in the corner, which doesn't really accomplish much for them. And now we follow up with another move that's forcing, knight to g5, check. They have to move their king. So let's say they go back here. What are we gonna do next? Wing to h5, again, forcing them to do something about this checkmate threat. So they might play rook to e8, try to create a space for the king to run. Well, now we can take on f7. Again, it's forcing. King has to go back. There's actually mate and four from here. It's queen h5 check, king to g8, queen h7 check, king to f8, queen here check, king here, and checkmate. All those moves were forced. Black never had a chance to do anything else, right? So that's what you're going to be looking for when you're trying to launch a successful attack. Can you use momentum in your favor? All right, the next principle is that certain openings tend to be better for setting you up to attack than other openings. 
And I think this kind of makes sense for a lot of people. If you're going to play an opening like the London system where you're, you know, pretty, pretty passive and you're just kind of doing this thing with your pieces where, you know, yes, you can generate some attacks in the London system. I'm not going to say you can't ever get an attack going, but it's, it's going to be very different than if you play something like the King's Gambit or the Danish Gambit, like we looked at, or, you know, there, there's, or some other very aggressive opening, right? Like those types of openings are going to lead to more attacking positions by nature than, than something like the London system. So if you do like to attack and you're an attacking player, it might be worth it to stop and evaluate your opening choices and see like, okay, you know, generally speaking, does this opening lead to very aggressive positions or, or not really? And if not, you might want to consider something else. All right, the next principle is that in practice, it's usually easier to attack than to defend. So uh, let me go back for a second to this Jerome Gambit, which really it's not a great opening, okay? But in practice, from this position, when white plays queen h5 check, white wins 47% of the time on average and black wins 49% of the time, which is pretty close. You know, the computer says minus 4.2. This is outstanding for black. You just play king e6 and black's just winning. But in, in practice, black has to figure out how not to get checkmated. Right? and how not to just lose back their pieces, and how not to lose their queen. And there's so many different pitfalls, and for whatever reason, a lot of times it's just harder to, to play the correct defensive move. So from a practical standpoint, being aggressive and attacking tends to, to benefit you. And actually, after White plays F4, they actually have a 54% win rate here, which is pretty crazy considering the fact that they're just down two pieces, but it just goes to show that it's difficult for black to defend in a lot of cases. All right, so that kind of wraps up the intermediate principles. Now I wanna move on to some more advanced ones that tend to be a little bit trickier to figure out, but hopefully this, this is gonna help you. So the first advanced principle is you need to have enough pieces when you're attacking. Now that's an advanced principle because how do you answer that question? Well, what, what's enough, right? That's gonna come with experience. That's gonna come with practice. But as a general rule, um, you know, if your queen is involved in one other major piece, so like a knight or a bishop or a rook on an exposed king, that's usually going to be enough. Now, that's not always the case, but uh, as a general rule, I think that's pretty good. So going back to this Greek gift example, when we sacrifice our bishop, we're obviously going to be losing our bishop, so that's not going to be involved anymore. What are we going to have once this attack gets going? How many pieces are going to be involved? Well, the knight definitely. And then once we bring the queen out, it's probably going to be the knight and the queen. Right, this knight's pinned and far away. This is blocked. This is obviously this rook over here is obviously too far. Maybe the bishop at some point could get involved, but most likely it's going to be just the knight and the queen. And so then you want to kind of ask yourself, well, is a knight and a queen enough? And like I, that's why I gave you that rule. Normally on an exposed king, a queen and one other piece is probably going to be enough. Now a queen and knight happens to be really strong because of the way they work together a lot of times, but. Um, you know, had black had, let's say there was a queen sitting over here on g6. Well, now, you know, I don't think the knight and the queen is going to be enough because that queen's just probably going to neutralize my queen. And what am I going to do? I don't have enough pieces. In that case, maybe I would need a rook or maybe I would need this knight to be involved or this bishop to be more involved. Um, but in this case, because the queen's kind of out of play, as we saw earlier, the knight and the queen was enough to get the job done, right? So tricky question to answer, how many pieces are enough? But that's something that you want to kind of try to think through before you make the sacrifice. So in this position right here would be when you want to be asking yourself that question. If I sacrifice my bishop, do I have enough pieces to finish off the attack, right? And that, like I said, that comes with experience and practice, but that's something you definitely want to be thinking about. All right, so the next two advanced principles kind of go hand in hand. So the first one is many times when you're attacking, you need to use all of your pieces. Now, when I say all of your pieces, I'm talking about the knights, bishops, queen, uh, and rooks. Okay, not the pawn, necessarily the pawns, but all of your major pieces are probably going to have to be involved. And then the second one that kind of goes hand in hand with that is a lot of times you have to sacrifice multiple pieces to pull off a successful attack. You can't just sack one piece and then that's the end. I got checkmate. A lot of times you got to keep going, right? Because your opponent's going to be trying to stop you. So to illustrate this, I want to show you a game that's been dubbed the Immortal Game. This is a game played by Anderson back in 1850, I believe. Um, really nice game. If you haven't seen this one, you're going to enjoy this. I'm going to go quickly, but I want to illustrate some important points. So he plays the King's Gamut, this Bishop C4 line. It's pretty crazy stuff. And we get to this position right around here. So he sacrifices a Bishop, first of all, to get these pawns rolling over here and, and get an attack going. Okay. And then 
right around here. All right, it's looking pretty nice. And at this moment, okay, this is a crucial moment in the game. White plays knight to d5, so he's ignoring this guy. He's going for the attack on the queen, and he's also ignoring this, which is going to create this threat. So watch what happens next. Black captures, and now Anderson plays this move, okay? And you, you notice the rook on a1 is undefended, and it can be captured with check, right? And then you also notice there's a bishop here. What does this mean? This means white is about to lose both rooks. And so it, this really shows the point of like, sometimes you have to sacrifice multiple pieces. So we already sacrificed the bishop. Now we're sacrificing two rooks. And notice how every single piece is kind of going to be involved, right? These rooks are playing their part by getting sacrificed and making black waste time. And then all the other pieces are ready to go. So watch what happens next. Black captures with check. Move here. Captures this rook as well. And now white just plays the simple e5, getting another piece involved, getting this pawn up. And there's all kinds of threats here, um, but the finish is really nice. So knight takes g7, king goes over, queen comes in, sacrificing again the queen, uh, bishop check, and that's actually checkmate. So you saw how both of those principles were used or applied in this game, sacrificing multiple pieces and really using almost every piece on the board, right? Like, why doesn't have much left? Everything was thrown at the king. Now, obviously, this is a perfect example of how everything works out nicely, played by a very, very strong player who is really, really good at tactics. But even the concept, I think you can take to your game uh, and, and, you know, apply it in your games as well. All right, the next principle is that a successful attack doesn't necessarily have to end in a checkmate. Sometimes you can just win back material or, or win a queen or win a rook or, you know, something like that, and it's a success. Um, now, it's nice when it ends in checkmate, and obviously that's better that's the best thing because game over immediately but even winning material can be good so let's go back to this jerome gambit for a second i know i'm talking about this one a lot um everybody's gonna start playing this but we play queen h5 check the king comes up and let's say we play f4 and black does make that mistake we talked about it plays knight f6 well we don't have an immediate checkmate okay but we can capture king moves capture and guess what we just got back both of the pieces we sacrificed and what else do we have? We have all of our pawns. Black is missing two pawns, so we're ahead two pawns. And we can still castle if we want, and black can't. Okay, all of those things combined, and we, we just, we're just winning, right? We, we didn't get checkmate, but we're winning. The attack was successful. So keep that in mind. You know, sometimes it's easy to, to put the blinders on and think, well, I don't see a checkmate. I, I have to just keep looking for checkmate. Sometimes you have to step back and say, well, maybe, maybe I don't need to get checkmate. Let's see, I sacrificed a bishop if I'm able to win a rook or a queen, well, that's gonna be good enough. And I'm gonna be able to, to win the end game like that. So um, definitely keep that in mind as well. But the next principle is that a good attacker needs courage. So I wanna go back to this game. This is the one I just showed you a little bit ago with uh, Anderson, the immortal game. And right at this moment, when he played the move knight to d5, I, and I don't know, maybe he calculated all the way to the end where it was checkmate. But if he didn't, um, he would have had to be been willing at this point, basically, to say, you know what? I'm probably going to lose both rooks. Looks like I'm going to get an attack. I think it'll work out, but, you know, maybe he wasn't sure. And guess what? He played it anyway. And this is the kind of stuff that, personally, like, I've played a lot of games like this where I'm like, I feel like this should work out. I don't actually see all the way to the end. I don't actually see the checkmate. I don't actually see the win. But I'm, I'm going to have a little bit of faith. I'm going to have a little bit of courage. And I'm going to go for it, right? Like, this is a gutsy move because if he's wrong and he miscalculated something, guess what? He's down two rooks. He's going to lose the game if he's not able to come through and get the mate, right? But that's part of chess. Like, and sometimes you will lose games. But y you're not going to have those nice finishes. You're not going to get some, some really sweet sacrifices that lead to mate if you're too afraid to sacrifice pieces and never go through with it. Now, obviously, you have to do it in a smart way, but you need the courage to be able to come up with these types of things, right? And so a good attacker has courage. All right, the next principle is that you need to be familiar with the most common checkmate patterns. So actually my most recent video, and I'll put a, a link somewhere up above my head here if you wanna go to that. Uh, I talked about the top 23 checkmate patterns. So there's all different types of setups that can lead to checkmate involving the queen and the rooks and the bishops and the knights. You need to be familiar with those to really increase your chances of, of attacks working out successfully. If you're not familiar with any of those and you try to attack, you're probably gonna miss a lot of things. So 
Um, I'll give you a chance at the end of the video, I'll probably throw that video out there and go watch that if you haven't, but that's super, super important. All right, so now that we've looked at all these different principles, I wanna show you an example game that I played recently. Now, I had a pretty nice attack and it, the, the ending of this game was pretty sweet, but I wanna talk about some of the principles that came up as I played this game. So let's go ahead and get into it. I played Bishop F5, this is called the Baltic Defense. I've been playing this quite a bit lately. I really like it against the Queen's Gambit. It leads to some pretty interesting positions. This is not the best way for white to approach it, to go for this pawn on B7, but a lot of people do that. So captures, captures, and bishop e3 is kind of a weird move. And as soon as I saw this move, I was like, okay, well, you know, normally white wants to bring his bishop out, right? And now that means they're probably going to have to bring it out over here. So that's kind of the first thing that sort of set my mind thinking like, okay, how do I take advantage of this? So um, I continued developing, went ahead and castled, <laughs> played rook to e8, and Right here, I played a move, and I'll give you a second. See if you can think, what move do you think I played? And after you come up with your answer, I'll tell you what I played, and then I'll kind of talk about some of the reasons why I played that. All right, well, if you said rook takes e3, you are correct. So that's what I played. And what was going through my mind was a couple things. Number one, I was asking myself the question, do I have a lead in development? Well, actually, yes, I do, right? Because I'm, you know, I have four pieces developed. I have my rook ready to go and I'm castled. And my opponent, while he does have the four pieces out, they're not castled. And so that's a small thing, but it's it's something, right? So I am a little bit ahead in development. Do I have more control over the center? Well, I, I kind of do because this is pinned. So that knight's not really doing anything. And then, you know, my knight is, I could go there if I want. So I would say I have a little bit more control over the center. I also have the rook kind of lined up. Um... And then do I have a specific weakness to attack, right? So after I capture here, I'm kind of creating some specific weaknesses. Now there's a hole here. Um, this pawn is very weak. Like I can line up on that, probably gonna capture that. This is potentially now weaker than before. So I created some weaknesses by sacrificing that rook. And so that was kind of the initial thing that, that made me wanna play rook takes e3. Now, also a couple other things, you know, if you ask yourself, well, what's the key defender in this position for white, this bishop's doing a pretty nice job of, you know, defending this, kind of blocking off my rook. Like I can't really get through and do anything with that bishop there. And so in my mind, I was removing a key defender by sacrificing that rook. Yeah, I, I lost a rook, but hey, you know, you have to get through somehow. So uh, that's what I did. Also, I'm kind of creating now an open line that wasn't really there before. Before the bishop was just sitting there, I couldn't really do anything. Now it's just a, a weak pawn that I can, like I said, line up on. All right, so I played knight to g4, um, going for these weaknesses, attacking the, the, the weak spots that I see. My opponent played a3, and um, I went ahead and traded that off. I didn't want that to be a liability, and I wanted to capture this. So he took with the queen and obviously defend that. Um, and now I'm just piling up, making use of the open file that I have. And the fact that that's a backward pawn, uh, it's blockaded nicely. And I don't really know how white's going to defend that, except maybe something like king d2. And that's what they played. So then bring the other piece into the game. Remember, a lot of times when you're attacking, you need to use all of your pieces. And so that's what I'm doing. One, two, three, four, five. All of my pieces are now somewhat active, right? So, okay. Knight goes here. And I went ahead and captured the pawn since I had enough people attacking. And now I'm defending my um, bishop if I needed to recapture. I'm going to play bishop f3. So knight check. The king goes back. Bishop to e4. Again, this is kind of a pretty nice defensive piece, right? It's defending this. It's just kind of sitting there being annoying. My bishop was uh, okay. So I'm thinking if I can trade those off, it probably makes my threats a little bit stronger. So, okay. I did trade it. This knight comes in. And do you remember earlier when I said being familiar with mating patterns was very important? Well, I actually saw a particular mating pattern here and that led me to play the next move that I played. So I wanna give you a minute, pause the video if you would like, figure out what do you think I played and which mating pattern do you think I saw at the, the final end of the position? So go ahead, work through that if you want. And when you're ready, I'll show you the solution. All right, so if you're ready to see the solution, first of all, I'll go ahead and tell you the mating pattern that I saw was what's called the Arabian mate. And I think I actually missed this one in my video where I talked about the top mating patterns. 
And this one's probably a little bit more rare, and so I think that might be why I didn't include it. But nevertheless, even though I, I didn't include it in the video, um, it's a good one to know. And it starts out with queen takes, queen takes, rook takes. And here my opponent actually made a mistake. King g1 is a little bit better, although I'm still way ahead. But king to f1 was played in the game. And I played knight to e3 check, which this is defended by my knight. So it forces the king over. And now do you see the killer move? Knight to f3 check, forcing the knight to capture. And then my rook g2, and that's checkmate. This is the Arabian mate pattern. A lot of times when you see this, it's like on the edge of the board. So this is kind of a, a weird case where it's not the edge of the board, but there's two pieces there, so it may as well be. But the knight defends the rook, and, you know, king can't move. Uh, so super nice finish to the game. And that's what I saw back, you know, when I brought the queen down on e2 and stuff. So, so yeah, hopefully that goes to show the importance of understanding and recognizing those mating patterns quickly. Um, this was a game I was really proud of, and I felt like I, a lot of those principles that we talked about really came together in this game. So I hope you guys enjoyed this and learned something. Don't forget to check out this video right over here uh, where I talk about all the mating patterns. You're going to definitely want to have that as a skill set if you're going to be um, attacking successfully. So I will catch you guys in that video. But as always, thanks for watching. Stay sharp, play smart, take care.